keeping things going. Our next speaker, Emily Calandrelli, will keep her high energy and enthusiasm for science literacy on the stage. She loves to explore the benefits of space exploration and support women in STEM careers. Emily is the host and co-executive producer of a hit Netflix series, an Emmy-nominated host, and her first two TEDx talks have over 1 million views on YouTube. Prior to her work in science communication, Emily attended West Virginia University, where she received degrees in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering. And if that wasn't enough, at MIT, where she received two master's of science degrees, one in aeronautics and astronautics, and the other in technology and policy. Through her work, she wants to make science relatable, easy to understand, and more exciting today than ever before in history. Today, Emily is going to share her own story, as well as discuss the path forward, what it looks like for women in STEM, including what women can do to help support and encourage each other. She's got that lively crew out in Cary. Emily, welcome to the stage over at the MetLife Global Technology Hub in Cary. Oh, wow. Well, that is certainly a nice welcome. Thank you all so much for having me. My name is Emily Calandrelli on the internet. You may know me as the Space Gal, and I am so excited to talk to you about my sort of unexpected career in STEM, the importance of women in STEM, and some strategies that we can employ to make STEM more welcoming for everyone. So just to give you an overview of my career, as Katie mentioned, my background's in aerospace engineering. I studied aerospace engineering for nearly a decade. And then when I was graduating from MIT, I got a call from a production company that asked if I wanted to be the host of a TV show. And I thought that sounded like a fun adventure. And I said yes, that was a decade ago, and now I'm a science communicator, which means I talk about science on TV, through books, through public speaking, and on TikTok and other social media platforms. But this is not the career that I expected to have. And I like telling the story because my story of getting into STEM is unlike a lot of my peers. I didn't know any scientists or engineers growing up. I'm the first person in my family to pursue a degree in STEM. Them. Many people in my extended family didn't go to college. Many didn't graduate high school. And so for me, I decided to go into engineering because I was a very practical high school senior. And as a high school senior, I Googled all the majors that one could major in in college, and I looked at their starting salaries. <laughs> and I learned that engineers made good money. And so I thought... I'm gonna hate my life for the next four or so years and it's gonna be boring and it's just gonna be awful, but I'm gonna make my family proud and I'm gonna make some money. And so that's how I got into it. And little did I know how much I was going to love it and become obsessed with it. And I just, I would never turn back. And so I didn't know what type of engineering I wanted to do, but I knew that if you took a class in aerospace engineering, you could fly on something called the Vomit Comet. And if you haven't heard of the Vomit Comet, it will soon be your favorite thing. The Vomit Comet is an airplane that flies in the air like an 8,000 foot roller coaster in the sky. And it does this so that the people, and usually the science experiments, it's often used as a laboratory, will float weightless, like astronauts. And so it goes up and down and up and down. And when you go over the hump and you free fall, that's when you experience weightlessness or microgravity for about 30 seconds. And then you feel heavy, so you feel weightless and heavy and weightless and heavy for an hour and a half which is why they call it the Vomit Comet. But that is how I got into aerospace engineering and to illustrate how much fun it is, I've flown on it three times now, I wanted to show you some videos of my experience. <laughs> Before we land, I have a few things left on my zero G bucket list, a spacewalk, plus some acrobatics, snacking, and even juggling. Can actually do it on the Another dance move we need to try is the pirouette. On land, Sam's pirouette was smooth and effortless. Let's see how he does up here. Effortless, but not so smooth. Now it's my turn. Obviously not a professional dancer. Wow! <laughs> Maybe if we hold hands, we can have more control. <laughs> Not quite. What did it work? <laughs> Whoa. Hey, Dad, coming out. Really? Here's another experiment, jumping through a hula hoop. Yeah! 
<laughs> now that I've seen Sam's attempt, it's my turn. Let's face it, if you're going to have a once-in-a-lifetime experience, you might as well have some fun. <laughs> Ow, that is how I got into aerospace engineering, but I am one of the more unique ones because as women make up 57% of the U.S. workforce, we only make up 29% of STEM jobs. And when you get to the upper management levels of these STEM companies, that demographic, gets even worse. And to highlight the demographic of people in the highest positions in the aerospace industry, we can look at the people who have gone to space. And now these numbers are changing pretty quickly, which is exciting because there are now many more ways to get to space, but the demographic is still relatively the same. Of the 600 or so people that have gone to space, only about 12% of them have been women only about 12%. Now, NASA is doing a much better job of choosing astronauts that look like our population, but that wasn't always the case. And back when they sent their first woman into space, Sally Ride, the engineers on the ground were not that diverse either. And so in 1983, when they sent Sally Ride into space, there was some question as to what to include in her personal kit in space. And so the engineers on the ground, all of whom were men at the time, asked her, is 100 tampons the right number of tampons for a six-day mission. <laughs> and for those of you listening who haven't had, let's say, the joy of experiencing a period, that number is too high. <laughs> that number is too high. And so she responded, no, that would not be the right number. And they said, well, we know that this is a little bit more than you need, but failure is not an option. And she was like, I work at NASA too. Uh, you can cut that number in half and you would still be safe. And so this is a somewhat silly but true story of when you don't have women in the loop, inefficiencies arise. Here are some other examples. If you've ever been in an office that felt just a little bit too cold, that might be because the formula to determine the standard office temperature was developed back in the 1960s and they used the metabolic resting rate of the average man. And so today, office temperatures across the country are typically around five degrees too cold for the average woman. If you've ever waited in a long line in the women's restroom and noticed that there was ab absolutely no line in the men's, which, I mean, everywhere, right? And that could be because when civil engineers and architects, both male-dominated fields, are determining how much space they should allocate for both the men's and women's restrooms, they often allocate the same amount of space, which seems fair but let's take a closer look. In men's restrooms, you have both stalls and urinals, so more people can relieve themselves in the same amount of space. Women, on average, need about twice as much time in the restroom as men. The majority of elderly and disabled are women. They need more time in the restroom, and children are more likely to accompany women to the restroom than men. A separate and different problem, but that's a talk for another day. And so is it really fair that we allocate the same amount of space for both uh, men and women? What would bathrooms look like if more women were in the room when they were designed? And of course, there's personal protective equipment like masks and body armor. There was a story out of the UK where a female police officer was dealing with excruciating pain from wearing her ill-fitting body armor for 10 hours a day. And so she got breast reduction re surgery so that her body armor would fit properly. And after her story came to light, 700 other female police officers in her area said that their body armor wasn't fitting either. And then there's cars. So in some older cars, this is uh, more likely the case, but historically car manufacturers uh, use car crash tummy dummies based on the male body for their safety tests. And because of this, women, when they are in a car crash, are 47% more likely to be moderately injured and 71% more likely to be seriously injured um, than a guy in that same car crash. It wasn't even until 2011, which is really not that long ago, that the US required car manufacturers to even use female car crash dummies in their car crash safety tests. And even then, 
Those female test dummies were often scaled down versions, smaller versions of the male test dummy. And then unfortunately, it's just not as easy as that because women, we have different muscle mass distribution, we have lower bone density, we have different vertebra vertebrae spacing, and all of that determines how we are injured in a car crash. And of course, there's lack of female representation in the medical industry for decades. For decades, women were not allowed to participate in drug clinical trials, drug clinical trials. And because of that, there was a study out of UC Berkeley and the University of Chicago that looked at 86 FDA approved medications and found that women were twice as likely to experience adverse drug effects than men. And this is because drug dosages are based on clinical trials done on men alone. And so you can see through all of these examples, when we assume that the average male body is the average person, inefficiencies arise. At best, it's just a little bit annoying and inefficient, like too many tampons in space or waiting in a long line at the bathroom. But at worst, it's costing our health. It can be deadly. Right, And this isn't good for companies, it's not good for our country, and it's certainly not good for women. So what can we do about it? Well, there are, we've talked about it all day, there's so many different things that we can do across the pipeline from encouraging more people to pursue STEM to retaining them once they're there. We can uh, have 100% paid leave policies. For one, many women in STEM leave after having their first child, but one thing that I want to focus on is something that I'm very passionate about, and that's representation. And representation of women in STEM is so important because seeing somebody who looks like you doing the thing that you want to do makes that thing feel all the more relatable and something that you might possibly be able to do yourself. And so I didn't quite realize when I got the call after MIT to be the host of a new space TV show that that was such a unique experience. I didn't know it at the time, but I became the first woman in STEM with her own nationwide science show. And because of that, I had a responsibility, in my opinion, to use that position wisely. So I had a decision to make. In my show, if you've seen it, we've done it for nearly a decade now. We have hundreds of episodes. We, are, we've, we have about 100 episodes, and we have interviewed hundreds of people. We had a decision to make. Do we interview people that look like the demographic of the aerospace industry as it is right now, or do we select people that would represent the demographic of the aerospace industry that we would like to see? So of course we chose the latter, um, successfully to the point where I've had people on Twitter uh, tweet at me because they're mad that there are not enough white men in my show. <laughs> because when you are used to priv privilege and representation, oftentimes equality feels like oppression. And so I've often um, worked to find other ways to provide representation through other media platforms. Through my Ada Lace Adventures, Ada is a third grader who loves science and technology. She solves mysteries with tech and gadgets that she builds herself. It's like a nerdy version of Nancy Drew. And it's a book that I wish that I had when I was younger. I sent the third book to space through the Storytime from Space program. And it's the first chapter book to be read in its entirety on the space station. And I've gone on to write more books. Reach for the Stars is a picture book I wrote after my daughter was born. And Stay Curious and Keep Exploring is a science experiment book. And as I was doing all of this, I was constantly pitching more science shows to big science networks. And I would get the, the same feedback from them. Because the people who watch these large science networks traditionally are men. Their, their audience is men. So they would say, we love the show. We love you as the host. One problem. The vast majority of people who watch our network are guys. And so we just don't know if they would relate well to a solo female host. And in one particular meeting, they asked me, do you have a boyfriend or something who could co-host this show with you? <laughs> Which is obviously disappointing feedback. And so you can imagine my surprise when I get the call from Netflix that said that not only did they want my show, but they were totally fine with me filming it nine months pregnant. And so now there is a nine month pregnant lady hosting a science show in 190 countries and 38 different languages on the largest streaming platform in the world. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm telling you, not a day goes by where I don't get a message from a family from around the world who says that this show is the reason their little girl wants to become a scientist when they grow up. 
It is the power of representation because I never saw anybody who looked like that doing science on television when I was a kid. And I don't think we should underestimate the power that this has on little boys too because seeing a woman do science who also happens to be a mom or a mom-to-be, that changes the way that we think about ourselves, but it also changes the way that we think about others and our expectations of others, our peers, our sisters, our, our family. Um, I've gone on to create a, my own science and space themed clothing line with women and girls in mind, something that I wanted to have when I was in college, things that say space gal and empathy and science and more women astronauts with girly designs and pink science stuff. It's the best. And I talk about science and space on social media. And my goal with this is to make science feel more welcoming to more people. And to do that, I employ something called empathetic science communication. And what I mean by that is that I believe that humans are not like computers. I know that humans are not like computers. We are not as analytical as we'd like to believe. The things that we perceive to be facts, the things that we know, quote unquote, know to be true, are influenced by so many things, primarily our worldview. What is our worldview? Well, you can think of your worldview as this sort of like makeshift house that is held up by pillars from things that you find important, things like your community values, your upbringing, your culture. And here's the big thing. When a new idea comes at you, when someone presents to you a new idea that goes against your worldview, that threatens to renovate that house, your brain acts like a bodyguard and prevents that worldview or prevents that idea from entering your worldview, entering your house. But not only that, it doesn't just do that. It also will build up fences and dig moats and build up a security system so that next time when that idea comes, it can't get anywhere near your house. And this is known as the backfire effect. So the backfire effect is this psychological phenomenon that when our deepest convictions are challenged by contradictory evidence, we reject that evidence and also leave that conversation with our original beliefs more strongly held, the backfire effect. So as a science communicator and just a person in general, the backfire effect is a depressing psychological phenomenon. So what can we do about it? Well, you can present facts and evidence to, let's call them unwelcoming houses, in a better way, in a way that makes them more likely to be accepted into those houses. And one thing that we can do is simply to be kind. And this sounds very altruistic, but there is science behind this. So in our brains, we have something known as the prefrontal cortex. This is the front part of our brain that deals with information processing and decision making. We also have something known as the amygdala. And the amygdala deals with raw human emotion. Think things like fight or flight, eating, finding your mate. And in low stress situations, when you don't feel threatened or attacked, then the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala work together as a team to react to information and make a rational decision. But when you feel threatened or attacked, the amygdala has the power to completely shut off the prefrontal cortex. Meaning, when you put somebody on the defensive, when you're trying to have a conversation with them and you personally attack them, you are scientifically removing their ability to think critically about that situation. So being kind can go a long way towards changing somebody's mind, towards influencing them. And we have to be a little bit more than just being kind, we have to be empathetic. We have to understand the underlying motivations that led them to their original beliefs. We have to be empathetic. And one way to illustrate this, I wanna give a personal story here. I'm from West Virginia. And a fun fact about West Virginia that I don't personally find that fun is that West Virginia is the number one state in the entire country when it comes to the fewest percentage of people that believe that global warming is happening. And as somebody who loves West Virginia, loves the people of West Virginia, and also love science, I wanna shed light as to why this is, because it's far more nuanced than many people might think, and it all has to do with coal. So if you're from West Virginia, if you're from Appalachia in general, you know that the story of coal that you've been told is inherently different than the story that you'll hear elsewhere. 
If you are from West Virginia, the story of Cole that you've been told is one of a love story. It is the best rom-com Hallmark movie. Ryan Gosling is probably starring in it. It is a beautiful story of this God-given gift of Cole that helped keep the lights on in West Virginia, helped keep the lights on for America. And oh boy, aren't we so lucky. And we get this message from many sources, but one of the most powerful sources in West Virginia is a Cole organization called Friends of Cole. And their mission statement says, Friends of Coal is dedicated to inform and educate West Virginia citizens about the coal industry and its vital role, here's the important part, in the state's future. Not a historical understanding, no, in the state's future. And they do this through two different methods. One is they pick cultural icons in West Virginia to be spokesmen for them at sporting events and in commercials, and they just, they pay them a lot of money to be a friend of coal. And this includes NASCAR drivers, professional bass fishermen, and uh, head, head football coaches of the big West Virginia football teams. Go Mountaineers. Now that might sound a little trivial, but in West Virginia, when you have a poverty crisis, when you have an opioid crisis, when you have an obesity crisis, when you have a teacher pay crisis, you have a lot of things going on, but the football team is good. I mean, you latch on to the success of that football team and you hail the people who make it so. And so when the head football coach of the West Virginia Mountaineers is a friend of Cole, that means something. And while that strategy is a little concerning, it's the work that they do in schools that's really troubling. They funnel money to teachers who are willing to teach coal lessons designed by the coal industry. And so when I talk about climate change in West Virginia, I think of these kids. Because one, they've been taught that if you're not a friend of coal, then do you hate West Virginia? Do you hate yourself? Because your worldview house is built, the, the, the ceiling, the floor, the walls, it's all built with coal. That's your identity, that's who you are. And two, every single person you'll meet in West Virginia knows somebody who lost their job thanks to the dying coal industry. My dad lost his job thanks to the dying coal industry growing up and it was a scary time for our family. Some families bounced back, many did not which led to a lot of different problems. And so when I talk about climate change in West Virginia, I don't talk about greenhouse gases. I talk about how solar power can help replace a lot of these jobs. And by the way, solar farms can be placed on land that's been revealed from mountaintop mining. And just a silver lining, it doesn't pollute your air or pollute the water that you drink and you don't have to worry about your son dying every time he goes to work, right? So I don't say, I don't talk about it through a scientific lens, I talk about it through an economic one because you have to bait the hook to suit the fish. Talk about what they care about, not what you think they should care about. And the last thing that you need to ask yourself if you're trying to be influential, if you're trying to change somebody's mind, you have to ask who is the best messenger for this situation. Because study after study has shown that to change somebody's mind or to influence them in some way, that person needs to trust you. That person needs to find some commonality between you. Their makeshift house needs to look somewhat similar to yours or at least be in a similar neighborhood as yours, right? So you may not be the best messenger for the person that you are trying to convince. If we're trying to bring more women in STEM, if we're trying to make STEM more diverse, who is the best messenger for that? Because if a guy is telling me that their company is safe and welcoming for me as a woman, that message won't hold as much weight than if I were talking to a woman. Similarly, as a white woman, if I'm talking to a person of color and I'm telling them that a space that I'm occupying is safe and welcoming for them, that's not going to hold as much weight than if they see somebody who looks like them giving them the same message. Because after all, we all wanna go to a place where we're celebrated, not where we're tolerated. And I wanna end with this image from the James Webb Space Telescope, because after all, I am the space gal. And this message will either invoke inspiration or send you into deep despair, but <laughs> this is the deep field image from the James Webb Space Telescope. And I wanna tell you what you're looking at here. The things with the spikes, those are stars in the foreground. And every other blob in this image is a galaxy filled with billions of stars. Now, why does this matter? A hundred years ago, we thought we were the only galaxy in existence. Just a hundred years ago. This image right here, thousands, thousands of galaxies. You might be wondering, how much of the universe does this picture take up? 
if you held a grain of sand in your hand and held it at arm's length and looked at the sky, this picture is the grain of sand area in the night sky. And so as you walk away today and we realize that all of our makeshift houses look a little different from each other, we have one, perhaps the most important thing in common. Thank you all so much for having me and Katie, I will send it back to you.